Hello there, fellow cultists. This is DM Nell, and I'm back with another episode of Shadow Talk. This is episode 128, and I'm continuing my spotlight of the Tales of the Demon Lord uh, adventure path for the uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord RPG. So we started, uh, or we, we started this uh, with the last video uh, in which I went into the introduction um, and um, spent a lot of time here uh, because there's a lot of good information in the, in, in the introduction, but the introduction is only two pages long. So the next section that I plan on covering today is the City in Shadows, and it's an even longer chapter, two, four, six, six pages. So I may cut this into two videos, just depending on how long I'm going. I do have a hard stop here um, because I have a game tonight. Unfortunately, not a Shia the Demon Lord game, uh, but I do have a, uh, a game that I'm running. So I do need to um, go to that. But let's go ahead and dive into uh, the City and Shadow. But oh, before I do that, I want to just remind everybody that the Kickstarter for uh, Shadow of the Weird Wizard is set to set to start next week. Um, I forget the exact date. I want to say it's the seventh. Could be the eighth, but it's definitely next week. Be on the lookout. Look in um, uh, look in Facebook. Look in the Shadow of the Demon Lord Discord. You'll get the exact date there. Uh, but uh, you know, jump on that bandwagon early, and uh, let's push that. You know, well, well past. It's uh, its initial goals uh, because we want a successful Kickstarter with lots of lots of crunchy stuff uh, provided by Schwab Entertainment. So be on the lookout for that. <clears throat> okay. So city in shadow. This is talking about the city that is featured in this adventure, which is the primary city, I should say, because there are other cities that are featured. But uh, this is the primary city of Crossings. Now, Crossings is um, not the largest city, I don't think, in the Northern Reach. Uh, there are some other cities that may be larger, uh, but it is definitely a fairly sizable city. And I believe it states that there is a significant population here. I want to say in excess of 10, 15,000. If I can remember where it says it. Anyway, it's somewhere in here. Um, but um, but yeah, it's um, it's situated, and I should probably have a map. Never prepared. Never ever prepared. Okay, so let me get my roll twenty account up so I can show you guys the map. I'm the map. I'm the map. Bum the map, 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 bum the map. I'm the goddamn map. Okay, so here we go. Shadow the Demon Lord and. Come on, man. All right, so this is the map of rule that I use in. Roll 20. And it shows you where Crossings sits in the Northern Reach. So if I shrink this down, you can get a better view of uh, the Northern Reach. So all this is Northern Reach. There's the upper part, and then there's the lower part. Crossings sits in the upper part of the Northern Reach, and it is situated between two pretty sizable lakes called the Blue Waters and the Dark Waters. I believe it actually sits on the Dark Waters, uh, but uh, Blue Waters is fairly close. So that is where crossings can be found in the Northern Reach. Now, where it sits in regards to other cities, you got Sixton down here, which is the provincial capital of the Northern Reach, and then you got Foundry up here, and then you have Gateway over here. Those are those are also sizable cities. So that's why I said I don't know if Crossings is the largest city. Okay. So anyway, back to the book here. So the adventure has the 
uh, some information on crossings, uh, some background information. It's good to know all this stuff. Now, before I go any deeper into this chapter, spend a significant amount of time reading this chapter and familiarizing yourself with it because this chapter alone is what is going to help you to build the connective tissue between all of the adventures uh, because it has all of the information that you need to tie the NPCs that are featured here uh, into your player characters backgrounds and uh, into the adventures that follow uh, because again the as I mentioned in my last video the adventures they don't assume anything they are just for the most part standalone adventures you as the GM has to you have to build in the connective tissue to get you and your characters from one adventure to the next now, I believe the first adventure does kind of hold your hand a little bit, and maybe a couple of them do, but for the most part, you have to, uh, you have to, you have to build those ties in. And the best way to do that is by using the NPCs that are listed here. Okay, so anyway, um, the City and Shadows Crossings, and Crossings is the starting point. Doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to spend all your time in Crossings, because really the only adventures that, that uh, are in Crossings I believe there's only, let's see, the first adventures in Crossings, um, second adventures in Crossings, I believe the fourth adventures in Crossings, of course the last adventures in Crossings. So there's about three or four adventures that are actually situated in the city. The rest of the adventures are situated outside the city. Um, but it's a good idea to use the city kind of as a um, headquarters. A place where your characters can go back to they can sell s stuff buy new items new gear it's a big enough city where they can find rare and exotic items and so uh, this is a really good city to use as your base of operations and everything else that uh, revolves around this these adventures uh, are close enough to crossings where it's only you know just um, a few days ride or um, you know walk uh, from crossings to the other adventure locales. So that's why I suggest that, you know, you, you keep your characters going back to crossings. There's actually kind of a built-in uh, potential uh, base of operations in crossings that the player characters can, uh, can use early in the adventure. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get to the, uh, the first adventure. Uh, but anyway, it gives you the background, a little bit of background information about crossings. Uh, talks about the government. And the government is a, um, a council uh, that is led by a mayor. The city council is represented uh, by members of the various districts in the city, which we'll get to more here in a bit. Um, but uh, you know, basically the uh, council advises the mayor and, you know, laws are passed and stuff like that. So the laws are enforced by the brown cloaks uh, within the city walls. They're the law enforcement and they're called brown cloaks obviously because they're wearing brown cloaks. That's their uniform. Um, now as it states here, and again, you need to read all of this because it gives you really good information that you can use in the adventures. And it basically states here that the brown cloaks basically care for the r middle to rich parts of town and the poor are kind of left to their own devices uh, to sort out their own affair uh, unless those affairs threaten the rich and powerful so the brown cloaks are definitely not good guys um, there are some good people in the brown cloaks which we'll highlight a couple here in a bit but uh, for the most part the organization uh, is not necessarily on the PC's side. Then you got the militia. The militia is called upon when the city itself is threatened by outside forces. Um, not probably going to need to uh, use the militia in the adventure unless you expand some of the uh, parameters of the adventure. So let me just kind of stop right there. When I ran this, uh, this was my first Shadow of the Demon Lord um, campaign. I had run a couple of one shots, but this was my actual first campaign running Shadow of the Demon Lord. So I was still a newbie when it comes to Shadow of the Demon Lord. And 
I wanted to cram in as much of the Shadow of the Demon Lord lore as I could into this campaign. So when I ran this, I, I ran this with the understanding that the Empire was crumbling and that the new Emperor Drudge was trying to solidify his base of power. And so he was sending troops to, you know, all of the territories in order to make sure that they are still loyal to the empire and they're not drunk going to try to, uh, to, to leave the, the imperial control. So I actually had um, some, war, some orc war bands threatening uh, the Northern Reach. And by the end of the adventure, they had marched up to, uh, to crossings and then the militia was called out at that point. So I did use the militia in my campaign, but it was only because I incorporated that extra bit of lore into my campaign, which is not really necessarily focused on in the adventure as written. But again, that disinformation is here in case you decide to branch out and do your own thing um, and you need to call upon militia. Um, okay. So now we get into the notable characters. These are the NPCs you're going to be using in this adventure and tying into your player characters. These can be people that your player characters already know or introduced in, uh, to early in the, in, the, um, in the adventure, or they can already have ties to them due to their backgrounds. So this is between you and your players. I suggest having a, a session zero, get a good understanding of what uh, your, your character's backgrounds are. Um, so, and this actually guides you a little bit. So let's start with the first one. Katerin Edgerton is the mayor of Crossings. And it suggests right here that she may be somebody that um, your characters, if they're commoners or if they're professionals, uh, might have links to. So, you know, that is, that's a good, that right there is a good, I mean, this is basically saying she is a commoner or professional if you want to stat her up because they don't have stats for her. But again, if you, if you have uh, characters that have, that are, you know, they're commoners or profession, uh, professionals, then they might have ties to Katerin. Maybe they knew Katerin before she was elected. Uh, maybe they had worked with her uh, in some other capacity before she was mayor. Uh, something along those lines, that way that gives them connective uh, 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 ties to the mayor. Uh, she is a, for the most part, she's a good, good person in this adventure. Uh, she's on the side of the poor. And so a lot of the council are, are constantly fighting her because a lot of the council are represent, you know, they represent the, uh, the rich. Um, okay, so that is Kat Turin Edgerton. Um, she is, again, potentially an ally for your party. Um, and she may call upon them because of the fact that she is constantly under attack by other um, factions within the council. One of those factions is Elder Fob. Elder Fob represents the city's halfling population. So um, there's a significant ha halfling population. Uh, there's also a significant dwarf population. Not so much elf um, or orc, uh, although there are those. And not so much of the other trees. Um, there can be plenty of clockworks in uh, in crossings, I believe I actually had a good um, a good population of clockworks in crossings when I ran it. But um, Elder Fob, uh, he represents the halflings, and um, he's he's done so for sixty years. So he's been here for a while. Um, he acts like a kind of a dork. He 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 puts on this 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 uh, this mask that he is, you know, kind of a, um, he's kind of aloof. Uh, he is uh, not very with it. And so he seems like he's not a threat, but he is actually a secret member of the Brotherhood of Shadows. And he actually leads the Brotherhood of Shadows, Shadows cell that is headquartered here in Crossings. And he is, you know, obviously a little bit more savvy then he lets on with his fellow council members. So he is the guy that is secretly pulling the strings behind the scenes 
uh, trying to get his agenda um, to um, you know to, uh, to to go forward. Um, so let's see here. Elder Fob, a secret man of the Brotherhood of Shadows. He works to spread the cult's influence in the city. He and the other cultists keep their identity secret, with Fob using illusion magic to disguise himself. Uh, the halfling pushes the powerful criminal uh, Ambrose Quick to oust Katrin as mayor and put someone else in charge, preferably someone in the cult. So he is one of the ones that's trying to get her out, but he's trying to do that using another NPC, Ambrose Quick, and who, which we'll get to here in a moment. So that is Elder Fob. Now, Elder Fob can be somebody that um, your player, char player characters have connection to. If, obviously, you're running, if you have a player that is running and a halfling. Uh, that's directly connected to Elder Fob's wheelhouse, right? So um, that's a way. You also, if you have somebody that has, um, you know, interest in politics or some kind of uh, political background, they may have worked with Elder, Bo Elder Fob at some point as well. Um, okay, so the next NPC is Father Paulus, or Fa Father Paulus. Now, I, ca I called him Paulus, but, you know, you do you. So he's an acolyte of the new god, and he champions the cult of the new god on the council. Um, so he is, he's gaunt. Uh, kind of old, and he wears a black habit of his faith and a simple wooden holy symbol. Uh, he's a staunch intellectual. He uh, peppers his speech with fancy-sounding words, though it's unclear if he knows what uh, many of those words mean. So there's a chance for you to pull out all those um, $25 words and make it sound like you know what you're talking about when actually uh, this character does not. Uh, however, the interesting thing is, and one of the secrets is that Paulus is addicted to sex. Uh, though he tries to remain chaste, he can only stand a few days of deprivation before slipping in through the secret entrance of the gilded purse, brothel, and indulging in all manner of sordid diversions. Uh, he skims from the offering plates of the Temple of the New God to pay for his habits, leaving him a tortured man, strong in his belief and despising his own weaknesses. This is a great character. This guy is a, uh, you know, your, your textbook priest that has a dark, deep, dark secret. And play that out as much as you want to. If you have priest char characters, obviously, a uh, great connection right here uh, to the church. So uh, then we have the next one here is Commander Renna. She is a veteran. Um, she hails from Neverfall. She is one of the Citadel's, uh, which is one of the Citadel's Crusader states. Uh, and she has a post on the city council to ensure the crossings keeps the Crusaders supplied in foodstuff, arms, and clothing. Uh, in addition to her council seat, Renna also commands the, mil mil uh, the militia. So her role here, uh, not only commanding the militia, but using crossings as a way to uh, offer supplies or uh, ship supplies off to the Crusader states, which are in the Northern Reach. Uh, I'm not going to go into that here because they don't really feature in this campaign, but uh, that's basically her role here. So if your characters maybe come from the Crusader states, uh, states they may have What's going on? Nothing. Uh, they may have uh, ties to her. Uh, if they maybe if they're uh, martial, if they have martial character backgrounds, uh, maybe they trained in the militia with her. Uh, so, you know, she obviously has um, that martial background and um, can um, can assist in that regard. So um, that's Commander Renna. Then we have uh, Ezekiel. She's, she's an apprentice witch. She's the youngest member, member of the council, and she's dedicated to watching out for the interest of the poor citizens of Crossings. Um, you know, she looks like a typical witch, uh, except she's young. Uh, though she chafes at wasting time in meetings rather than spending time helping her people directly, Ezekiel stays on the council for the opportunity it gives her to spend time with Renna. So Renna and Ezekiel are having a fling. 
So there's that. I don't. I didn't really play that up. It really didn't come into play. But you know, if you've got um, you know that sort of thing going on in your game, then you can definitely use that as a as a hook. Um, but they keep it secret, and that's a uh, thing. You can also use Ezekiel uh, since she's a witch. Um, that has ties to you know, kind of a nature background. So if you've got uh, characters with nature backgrounds or uh, perhaps ties to the old faith, you know, if you uh, if you don't want to use Father Palace because he's a new God guy and your player characters are um, more new faith or old faith uh, people, uh, they might have ties with Ezekiel. Um, then we have Master Dreen. So Master Dreen is a striking man with dark skin, darker eyes, smooth shaved scalp, a deep, sonorous voice. Um, he represents the merchants of Crossing, so he's one of the rich ones. And so he is, you know, obviously looking out for the um, the rich folk. Uh, he features prominently in uh, the first level adventure, I believe. Then we have uh, Ambrose Quick. Ambrose Quick is a hired killer who is the leader of the guild. The guild is a uh, basically a thieves guild. It didn't actually call it a thieves guild, but it is actually a an underworld organization. Um, and so, if you have any uh, any rogues in your in your adventuring party, you definitely have a connection right there. So Ambrose Quick has spies on the street everywhere. Once they see a new rogue in town, he's going to try to recruit them. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a great way to uh, get that connection going. Uh, he's also trying to, this is Ambrose Quick, who is trying to, who's working with uh, Elder Fob to try to oust Catherine uh, Edgerton. So, you know, they, he, he is uh, either, you know, looking for ways to kill her directly or, you know, not directly or, you know, by finding ways to get rid of her. So death is definitely on the plate. Um, assassination is definitely on the plate. Uh, but, there, you know, if there are ways to discredit her, blackmail her, you know, whatever. He's into all that shit. So, you know, obviously that is um, a point of interest that you can incorporate into your campaign if you want to go there. I really didn't go there too much. I did, I did use him as a quest giver um, because we did have a rogue in our, in our party. And so that was a good... Uh, connection there that I used to get get them going on a uh, on a, on a quest. Um, so that is um, a connection right there that you can utilize. John Crawley is the leader of the Brown Cloaks. He commands them, and um, um, he is he can be a good guy or he can be a bad guy. It just depends on um, how you want to use him. Uh, he knows the city inside and out. And he loves it down to the last filthy cobblestone. But he is also a pawn of the city council and all the power brokers there, um, as well as other power brokers within the city. So he is uh, constantly under pressure to do the bidding of others while trying to do the right thing. So he may be somebody that you can um, utilize as a friend or foe. Um, Gundren the Ironmonger is a dwarf that made his fortune in mining. He represents the industry on the council and he is obviously a dwarf. Uh, he has ties to the ancient city of ancient dwarven city of Highstone and um, you know there's lots of connection connective tissue there with uh, dwarves. So if you've got a dwarf character in your party there you go right there is your way in. Uh, and you can get lots of uh, good, um, you know, quest giving from Gundren. In fact, there is a mining, there's a mining adventure in here, and there's another adventure that takes you to Foundry. So there's a couple of good ways of getting iron, uh, the iron, the ironmonger here as a um, NPC you can utilize. Uh, all right, and then we have Inquisitor Randolphus, one of my favorite um, NPCs, only because I made him my favorite. He's not really particularly called out in the adventure, I don't think. I, I don't recall him being called out too much, uh, specifically in the adventure, but I love the idea of the Inquisitor being in town, making everybody nervous, especially Father Paulus. Uh, so the Inquisitor is obviously looking out for 
you know, wrongdoings on behalf of the cult of the new god. And so he would be keeping an eye not only on Father Paulus, but pretty much the whole council member, uh, the whole council, looking for any type of or any signs of corruption. Elder Fob is scared shitless of uh, Inquisitor Randolphus. Uh, Ambrose Quick keeps a close eye on him, uh, obviously. John Crawley is un mostly annoyed by the Inquisitor because the Inquisitor doesn't necessarily uh, see law as a uh, ally. Uh, sometimes the law gets in the way of uh, the Inquisitor's uh, mission. And, you know, he's on a mission from God, right? So, uh, so yeah, Inquisitor Randolphus I used frequently in my campaign, and I've used him actually in subsequent campaigns as well. Um, all right, so those are the primary NPCs. There are other NPCs that are, that are introduced throughout the adventure uh, that you can obviously use as well, uh, or create your own. Uh, I created a handful of uh, NPCs for... Uh, for this campaign, just just to fill a couple of holes that uh, were missing um, that I needed. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously you do what uh, you have to do to make the game run smoothly for you. Uh, okay, so you have stat blocks for Inquisitor Randolphus, and you have stat block for Elder Fob. Everybody else, however, you have to stat up and um, you know, give suggestions. You can use a higher killer here, pickpocket, uh, apprentice witch, uh, or you can just come up with your own stat block uh, for any of these NPCs. Okay, moving on. People of Crossings. So the people of Crossings, um, humans make up most of the people living in the city. Uh, half of that population can trace its ancestry to the indigenous people of the Northern Reach. So lots of reachers in the city. Reachers are people that are indigenous to the Northern Reach, meaning that their families have been situated in the Northern Reach for at least a couple generations, or at least a generation or two. So they feel like their home is the Northern Reach and that the Empire is maybe in control, but not necessarily who they believe should be in control. So a lot of vibes of the colonies uh, you know, the American colonies and um, the relationship with England here. Um, but now that uh, the empire is uh, basically in turmoil, then, you know, the people of the Northern Reach are really calling for, you know, this is the time for us to be free from the imperial control. And there's a lot of that sentiment in crossing so you can play that up as much or as little as you want that's just kind of background information that you can interject if you want to um, many also have tribal tattoos um, the rest of the city's humans hail from across the imperial lands halflings are the second most significant population uh, however their numbers are even larger in the countryside uh, where they maintain their farms and tend to their herds Halflings mingle freely with humans, and marriages between humans and halflings happen from time to time. Alongside those two races, Crossings features other people living in and around the Empire. Brutish orcs can be found haunting the taverns in Old Town or brawling with the Jotun exiles that venture north to find their fortunes. Goblins tend to the city's sewers and keep the streets clean. Changelings infiltrate uh, the city in human and halfling guise. Clockworks, either fashioned locally or having arrived from far-flung places, struggle to find their place on the frontier. Here is a map of the city, and it shows you the various districts. Uh, and you got a legend over here that helps you identify the various districts. This is the rich part of town. This is the industrial part of town. Uh, this is the poor part of town. And this is the... Um, you know, the rest of town where the um, merchants and regular folk, uh, working class, reside. Um, okay, so city description. What is interesting and fantastic about crossings? Um, well, here we go. It's got uh, 19,000 people. That's what I was looking for earlier. It's got 19,000 people. Half again as many living on farms and small villages that surround it. Uh, the city spread, spreads across a ring of hills whose lower reaches are the southern shore of the um, 
dark waters, uh, a misty lake speckled with forested islands. One of those islands features uh, in the first level adventure. Uh, a wall of stone surrounds the city, and older lower walls rise within it, marking the boundaries of its districts or serving as mementos of other settlements that once stood here. So this, this city was built on the, um, b on the bones of older cities, particularly um, some fey cities. The Emperor's Road, built by crusaders bound for the north, ends at the city's center, where it meets the Grainway, headed east, and the Iron Road, headed to the west. Numerous smaller roads and trade le uh, trails lead in and out of the city by gates that pierce the outer wall. The river, known as the Stream of Tears, flows into the city from the barrows, draining into the dark waters. So this is the river. It drains in the dark waters. Thick clouds hover over the city most days, fed by the smokestacks rising from the Academy of Engineers, crowning High Hill over here to the right. Um, winds move much of the smoke and pollution west over the Black Hills, but soot clings to everything and everyone in the city. So I'm getting vibes of London in the Victorian times in, during the Industrial Revolution and, um, you know, Dick Van Dyke as the chimney sweep. Um, that, that those, are the, those are the vibes I'm kind of getting reading that um, that description. All right, so the fantastic element here are the fairy spires. So there are six slender towers of white stone that climb above the city, each one standing exactly 33 yards tall. Uh, the folks at Crossing believe that the towers were built by the Fae and named them as such long ago. However, the true history and purpose of the Fae spires are long lost. No doors or windows pierce the walls and efforts to dismantle them have all failed as the spires are impervious to damage. Most locals consider the fairy spires to simply be part of the scenery, though a few believe they hold great secrets and magical power. Okay, so you might be, you might be tempted, if, if you don't want to run all the adventures and you want to run some of your own homebrew adventures here, you might be tempted to use the fairy spires for that purpose. And I would advise you against that because the fairy spires feature prominently in the last adventure of this campaign. Um, they are actually part of a ritual that the Brotherhood of Shadows is using uh, to uh, open up a hole into the void to bring the Demon Lord here. And so by using the Fae Spires, you know, like if you if you had them break into one and you find that it's, you know, uh, the home to, you know, some kind of creature or whatever, you know, that, that kind of destroys the mystery of the face spires. The face spires should be a mystery throughout your entire campaign. You might even have certain arcane things happen to cause them to light up or cause them to have, you know, certain activity near them just to kind of, you know, give them more of an air of mystery. Uh, but anyway, that that is the, uh, that's one of, that's, I think the prominent fantastic feature of uh, crossings. Okay, now we get into the various, the descriptions of the various um, districts or parts of crossings. I'm not going to go through all this because it's a lot of information here, and I need to uh, um, I need to, I need to kind of wrap this up here. But um, you definitely want to read through this because each district has its own identity and its own feel to it and you want to present that accurately when your characters are exploring the city uh, so read through this and you might actually get uh, some you know um, adventure hooks um, ideas going through this because some NPCs are featured here uh, I'll call I will call out uh, in particular in the purse district which is the rich part of town uh, is where you're going to find Wizard's Peak. Wizard's Peak is where the NPC by the name of Charybdis uh, resides. He is like the most prominent wizard in Crossings. And so if you have a wizard character in your party, then they would probably have ties to Charybdis uh, and Wizard's Peak. 
Another thing I want to call out here is uh, in Grievings, you have Mercy Hill, which is a um, uh, it's a um, it's an asylum. And I believe it features in one of the adventures. I know I featured in one of my adventures. I just don't know if I added it or if I can't remember if I added it or if it was part of it. I think it was part of it. Um, but um, but yeah, you have, you know, who can who can pass up an asylum? You have a city with an asylum here. So you got to have you got to have some some sort of, um, you know, encounter in the asylum. You just got to. It's a missed opportunity if you don't. Uh, then, of course, you have the guild. It's also located in the grievings section of town. The grieving section of town is the poorest section. So these are the slums. You're going to find Mercy Hill there, and you're going to find the guild there. Uh, Old Town has the boneyard, which is a uh, graveyard, um, and so forth. So um, you just read through all of these. Um, you have a lot of good information here. Uh, and a lot of good places that the PCs can go to in order to get information, to get uh, support, to get quests, and stuff like that. Okay, so that is chapter... Uh, well, it's not, it's not numbered. So it's, this is the City in Shadow chapter. Highly important chapter. Read through it multiple times. Intimately familiarize yourself with both the introduction and this chapter. It will pay off in dividends when you run the rest of the adventure. So the next video is going to focus on the the uh, the starting adventure, Harvester of Sorrows. Um, so we will get into that next time. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching. And once again, uh, if you haven't subscribed, it helps me out uh, by getting more exposure to this channel more exposure to Shadow the Demon Lord, and hopefully more people playing Shadow the Demon Lord, buying Shadow the Demon Lord, and keeping Schwab Entertainment in business. Um, you know, they got, he's got a new Kickstarter out there, so we want to share the news that uh, he's got a new game coming out, closely linked to this game. You know, do your part, evangelize as much as you can, and uh, one way you can do that is by uh, subscribing to this channel. So please do so if you haven't already. And uh, hit that, that uh, bell icon if you want a uh, notification whenever I pump out another video. All right. So with that, I am going to wrap this up. Thanks for watching. And I am out of here. How the hell do you turn this damn thing off?